Skills. I'm the uh, president and founder of Category Management Knowledge Group. I've spent um, uh, I spent over 20 years at Procter and Gamble managing their Canadian category management team, and also served on their global category management committee. Um, Michelle is our director of training development. She also started her career at P&G, both in category management, sales, trade marketing, and 10 years as a corporate trainer. We've had lots of fantastic experience. Um, uh, love what we do. Um, and we have the opportunity to work with both retailers and suppliers, and we have a lot of international experience as well. Um, what I'm going to be taking you through today, this is a list of our courses that um, we currently have. This is our list of accredited courses. Um, and basically, uh, you can see it's quite a robust list, and kind of as you go down, it gets into more advanced um, topic areas. So what we're going to be doing today is um, this is kind of covering some of the um, more basics to category management, and I believe that our next uh, free webinar is getting into some of the more uh, intermediate subjects. So, and we do run these regularly, and I'll give you information at the end if you haven't seen our whole uh, calendar for 2014, but we run some great live webinars ongoing. So, I'm going to walk you through eight essential things that you need to know about the category, like um, as it relates to category management basics. Um, the first one, and if you know CMKG at all, you know how, in, how uh, adamant we are about the importance of understanding and knowing retailer strategies. So, why is understanding that the retailer strategy is so important in category management. The way that you have to think about it is that the retailer strategy is really an umbrella and it drives all of the different components of the category management process and the overall category plan. So the retailer strategy really makes sure that all of the retailers departments are working to, towards a united and consistent strategy. Here's the definition of category management and how it integrates with retailer strategy. So, the definition of category management is managing items in a product category as a strategic business unit and then determining the tactics based on the retailer strategy, competitive environment, and the target consumer. And that really is category management. If you take out that middle piece, different plans are created for each category that are based on the retailer's overall strategies. And those overall strategies for the retailer need to include the retail format, the target consumer, the competitive environment, and also the retailer's private label and no-name or control label brands. So the retailer really needs to make some decisions across these four buckets to properly develop a strong and cohesive overall retailer strategy. And I could just spend all day talking about retailer strategy. We actually have a complete course on it. Um, but here's just some of the questions that you really need to understand in order to properly really articulate a retailer's overall strategy. So when you take a look at these questions, if you're a retailer supplier but you can't answer these questions or you kind of have to guess at them for a specific retailer, category management and ultimately collaboration is going to be incredibly difficult. So for retailers who opt out of sharing any kind of strategies or what they're trying to accomplish in their stores or anything like that with suppliers, they're really limiting themselves because um, suppliers can't possibly come in with collaborative business plans and, and ideas that really tie in with what the retailer is trying to accomplish. The other thing that happens is that some retailers may not have well articulated retailer strategies. Others may have strategies, but they don't share them with suppliers. And then there's others who work very closely with there between retailer and supplier to articulate their overall strategies and they really expect uh, the suppliers to come into them with plans that will help them to achieve their objectives. And that's ultimately where you need to go if you want to be in a collaborative, uh, to have a strong collaboration between retailer and supplier. So the question really is to consider is how, can, how well can you articulate a specific retailer's overall strategies regardless of if you're working for the retailer or if you're calling on specific retailers um, because that really is the 
base foundational requirement in order to do an effective job in category management. Otherwise, it makes your job quite difficult. As a category manager and the retailer, if there's not cohesive strategies that are set, then it's really hard for you to make proper decisions based on what the retailer is trying to accomplish because it's not articulated. So that's why you can end up having category managers making very different types of decisions based on whatever it is that they're basing their decisions on. So it really provides the guidelines and the principles. The second um, uh, piece that I'm going to talk about is knowing your data sources. This is obviously important in category management because data is one of the most important requirements um, in order to do category management. So when you look at all of these data sources, what do they all have in common? We have scan sales data, retail measurement data, shipment and warehouse data, shopper loyalty data, and consumer panel data. What do they all have in common? Each of them are collected and measured differently, but they all have one commonality. Can you think of it? And if you have any suggestions, please type it in your chat box. And while I'm waiting for you to type things in, um, Scott, you asked why there's only eight versus ten uh, with the original and that that's crossed out. It's because I, when I went to develop this, I realized that I would go way over time if I tried to accomplish um, uh, including um, that many in the in the discussion, so I opted to only do eight. Okay, we have someone saying consumer data. You're close. One of the words is right. Thank you, Paula. The commonality is that they're all reliant on how much the consumer purchases. Ultimately, the consumer drives all of this, whether it's scan sales, market data, shipment data, etc. At the end of the day, what ends up in their shopping baskets is what generates the sales for it's not a very difficult concept to understand the importance of focusing on the consumer and the shopper in category management. You hear about it all the time, but very often there's still left equation. Each data source has that are really important to understand. I'm only putting in four here, but scan sales data, uh, um, retail POS data is the queen of category flexible analysis but it doesn't have comparative mark panels and data ongoing and maintain that segmentation ongoing, which many retailers struggle with. Then we have data. It's also a very powerful data source. Metric and causal analysis and comparative markets and channels for retailers and suppliers to benchmark against. But it's sometimes only a sample of stores projected to the total chain and sometimes market doesn't cover a large percentage of the total market, particularly in some categories. Also, the data can be very expensive. And it's one of the big issues with data is that as more and more data continues uh, to um, be developed, budgets don't tend to grow at the same rate, and so it's really hard to determine what are the right data sources to be purchasing for your organization, regardless of whether you're a retailer or supplier. The next data source is consumer panel data, one of my personal favorites. It's a great data source to get consumer and shopper information from. It includes consumer demographics, consumer purchase behavior, and market research can also be conducted using this data source. It's a great data source for finding nuggets of information that may not be able to find anywhere else. Um, you need to always make sure that the data is significant based on the raw number of buyers, and you should always focus on trends in the data and compare numbers to draw conclusions, but not use actual volumetrics from it because they, this is from panel data, and so sometimes the volumetrics are not um, nearly as accurate as some of the other data sources. And then finally, there's shipment and warehouse data that's um, the supply that the suppliers ship to the retailers' warehouses and the warehouses send to the stores. It's a last resort data source for situations where you need to create a total market, but you don't have any other data. And there are still um, scenarios where that happens in some industries where they're just disparate in data, and so this is one of the areas that they, they need to use this data in order to analyze their business. The problems with this type of data are that dollar sales are hard to quantify from cases sold because the costs can vary based on the customer ship two point. And also, if you're shipping product to one warehouse, where it's then shipped to multiple banners, you also can't see the allocation across the banners. 
So there, and if you don't know how these are measured and gathered and everything else, it's also a really important part of the whole um, understanding data is um, how they're how they're um, actually developed and the differences between them and when you should know uh, how to use them and when to use them. So you need to know your data, not just how it's collected and the strengths and weaknesses of the data, but also think about how it's accessed. Welcome to Go to Training. Online training made easy. There are 50 other callers on the call. The next question that um, you have to ask about the data is how difficult is the data mining tool to use? And how confident with the data are you with the data? Um, is, is it being correctly pulled out of the tool? Sometimes the tools can be very complex and um, if you're not exactly sure how to pull the data out, you can end up making errors just in, in the process of um, pulling them out of the tool. And then finally, how much usage is there of each of the data sources? Or even worse, are you even using it? Um, some organizations end up buying data and it's not even being properly used across the organization. And there's such, such a huge opportunity, it's kind of just waste, um, obviously, if you're, if you're spending money on a data source and uh, no one is able to, um, no one is using it. Then there's obviously a problem there. So there's nothing worse than presenting wrong data to anyone. It loses credibility. And even worse, it can end up leading to wrong decisions being made if the errors aren't caught. So it's so important to know your data and understand your data and make sure that um, it's being used correctly. And so because of all of these issues that can end up happening with data, if there's not proper training and such, what you end up have, have happening, happening is that you can lead it to data hole pickers, is what I call them, for lack of a better term who find the weaknesses in every data source and have everyone so scared to use the data that they don't. Especially if they've lost credibility once, if they accidentally pulled the data incorrectly or whatever, um, then they're, they may be apprehensive of ever even using the data again. And so ultimately, it leaves you with nothing. So it's really important to understand the watchouts of the data source and ensure that you're providing good access to the data for everyone and start training your organization on understanding the data sources and how they can be maximized. Okay, tip number three. Segment your data based on the consumer decision tree. Once again, a really critical component to set yourself up for some really good category management. Um, segmentation should be added to your item level database and um, by segmentation, I mean actually adding it literally into your level item level database. So I've got this example here of um, laundry detergent data, and we have our product descriptions. And um, I'm just going to turn my highlighter on here. So we've got our um, our products. Um, in, the, in this column and all of the items there and then you can see different um, uh, segmentation that we have here. So the first segmentation is subcategory or liquid or powder and then the tier, is it a price product, a premium product or a mid product and then brand, the size and the format. So these are all important um, uh, classifications for laundry detergents based on the consumer decision tree. And so once you're able to uh, establish um, those, uh, allocate that to different items within the category, then what you can have, it, you can end up with um, some great analytics associated with it just by tying in the data to it. So then we can tie in the retailer data and by doing some simple um, mathematical formulas, then we can end up uh, analyzing the data uh, to understand the biggest opportunities in the category based on what's important to the consumer. So without segmenting the data, and, and the luxury of um, uh, some of the the luxury of some of the um, data that we buy, like the uh, Nielsen and IRI um, retail uh, data, is that it's already segmented. And it's based, but it's based on their hierarchies, and so sometimes we're limited to looking at the data based on their hierarchies versus it being based on the consumer decision tree, and they're not necessarily always the same thing. So, um, adding in new fields into your data can be a huge under 
taking, especially for retailers, but one that is necessary for you to see the proper views of your categories. We've worked with many retailers where their data is only segmented to business unit, department, and category level, and then the only field below the category level is sometimes supplier and then item level information. So it really limits the insights that a category manager can derive from their data because they just can't look at their data this way. So huge opportunity. Um, but like I said, it is a big un undertaking. The next tip is knowing how to drill through data. And I'm going to be walking you through an example of, of how to drill through data. So we're going to start with a category assessment as a category manager that works for Retailer X. And the category manager wants to understand what is happening with their category, identify where the issues stem from, and then create an action plan to fix the issues. So we have Retailer X's top line category report on the, uh, on the screen right now. And it's latest 52 weeks for total category and then for some different manufacturers. We have, we're going to keep this simple um, to start with. So you can see the variables that are included in the report across the top, and each of these variables is important in order for me to better understand my business. So what I would like for you to do is take two minutes and review the results on this page, and um, then type into the chat box where you see the biggest area of concern or opportunity for this retailer based on these numbers. So I'll just give you one or two minutes here to take a look at the numbers, and then we'll come back and go through them together. Okay, I'm back again. Um, so let's go through the numbers together. First of all, we have the, um, the first three columns, which are dollar sales, absolute change, and percent change. And um, that's really going to um, show me how much, my vol how much volume I'm gaining and losing. In this example, the category is, oops, the category is down 2%, um, driven by manufacturers number two and number four. So uh, they're both down 7%. And uh, it's, but it's also important to look at the absolute volume to really understand who's driving the decline. And in fact, it's number two and number one. Um, let me turn on my highlighter again. So we have manufacturers number two and number four are down 7%, but when you look at their actual volume, the biggest concerns are actually in two. Um, so despite the fact that um, number four is down 7%, they're only down 276 in absolute, and there's others where there's bigger issues. So um, that's why it's so important to have your absolute change included in here. Um, then we get into market share. And the market share tells us how I'm performing. So retailer X in this example, represents 7.2% of the total market. So they, re they, they represent 7.2% of this total category with being compared against. So who can tell me if this is a good or a bad development number? You actually can't tell from this number because the 7.2 because you would have to compare it to their all sales share to categories that are similar to this. So if this was a laundry detergent category, then we would compare this to maybe some of the other um, household cleaning categories that are down the same aisle to see if that number is a good number or a bad number. But you can look at which segments they're most and least development developed in. Um, so you can see that in this example, they're very highly developed in control label with an 11.6 share of the market, and they're probably happy with that if they're strong, focused on private label. And then manufacturers number three and number four, as well as all other, are the least developed in the category. 
You can also see which ones are where they're they're pretty flat in market share change, and you can see that manufacturer has um, number two is where they've lost the most um, share in their market share as well. And then finally, we have the category share, and that tells you what percent each of the different um, manufacturers represent of the total category pie at this specific retailer. So manufacturer number one is the largest retail or the largest manufacturer uh, representing 43.5% of the total category business at the retailer. Can anyone tell me, um, because we know that manufacturer number one is down, they're down $438,000 and they're down 1% in dollar sales, how can they possibly be growing in share? Can anyone explain that? If you've got any suggestions, um, type it in your chat box for me. Thank you, Steve. Um, yes, the rest of the market, they're de declining at a um, faster rate than the, um, than the total market, and that uh, they are, sorry, the total category is down 2%, they're down 1%, so they're, they're declining at a um, slower rate than the total category is, and so therefore they're actually uh, growing share in a shrinking pie is basically how that works. And finally, one of the other things that you can do, I've got a top line understanding of what's going on in the category and by manufacturer for Retailer X, but it's also valuable to understand the volume results from a tonnage perspective. So I've added in some tonnage data in here now. And if the tonnage is growing at a faster rate than dollar sales, it means that the category is deflating. And in this example, the tonnage is declining at a faster rate at minus 4%. You can actually see that tonnage is has a huge issue across just about every single manufacturer. If you're not familiar with the tonnage um, measure, it is a really important one to um, take a look at in many categories because it flattens out dollar sales and really talks about um, usage. Um, so it, it's a like um, in, it, as an example with laundry detergents, it would be the, could be the number of liters that are being that are being sold. Um, so that kind of an approach too, which is another important way to look at the business. So now that I understand things from a top line perspective, the next is to go into things from a segment perspective. So in this category, the biggest consumer decision is on age group, um, or with a family, adult, and kids segment. Organics is also an important and growing segment, so I've included that in here. Um, it's kept separate from the others. Um, it's important to note that organics is also incorporated into the family, adult, and segment results. So those of you who are quick on the calculator and go and do the math, that's why the numbers don't add up, is because the organics are kind of a duplicative amount that is also included somewhere else, but it's a really important segment for um, this retailer to understand. So. We're going to go through these numbers together and really try to get a better understanding of what's driving things at a deeper level um, by looking into the family, adult, and kids segments. So we already know that the category is down 2% versus year. So what segments are driving that negative 2% growth? Um, Jeremy, you asked about is time similar to an equalized volume or size measure, that's exactly what it is. And when we take a look at the numbers, um, you can see that the family segment is down 4% and the kids segment is down 3% 3 and those are ultimately driving that negative 2% um, for the total category. As I mentioned, it's always important to look at the absolute uh, volume change as well. And so when you take a look at those numbers, then you could that the in, in terms of absolute volume, um, the family segment is losing the most and uh, as, as is the kids segment. So um, that, that is kind of confirmed that it's the right numbers to be looking at and the, the, the key segments to be looking at. So 
all three segments have had uh, declines over the latest 52 weeks, and that's translated um, when you take a look at that absolute volume change number up at the top to almost $1.8 million. As a category manager, you should also have a sense of what segments you're most and least developed in based on their market share. So some retailers use this as one of their key measures in their, base, in their business on an ongoing basis. So when you take a look across the market shares, what, are the le what is the least developed segment for the retailer? Correct. Sorry. Uh, it is adult. It's the least developed segment with a sin share. And the easiest way to compare that is um, just by uh, comparing it to that top market share number. So it's not um, significantly underdeveloped. And this is when it really ties into the whole um, understanding the retailer strategy and who their target consumer is that's coming in the store because the objective should never be for the retailer to be at the market share across all of the segments within a category. Because if they're focused on their target consumer, and as an example, if they're um, focused on large families with children, then their objective may to be to be highly developed in the family segment and the kids segment and kind of leave the adult segment to be underdeveloped because if they're going to be highly developed in some segments, they're also going to be underdeveloped in quotation marks in it other segments and it's a, that's the kind of things where if there's no retailer strategy you don't know that so retailers are trying to achieve you know um, being being developed in everything kind of and so if something is overdeveloped something else has to be underdeveloped and um, like I said if this is a great example of the target consumer piece you don't want to be just at the market you want to be highly developed in the segments that are most important to your target consumer. Okay, so the largest segment. So now we're looking at category share. And the category share, when you take a look across them, um, it's the adult segment, which represents 47.9% of the total business at uh, this specific retailer. And then when you look at the share point change, there's really no, no big change in that. But this is a number that obviously manufacturers tend to look at quite quite deeply when they uh, get their share information as if they're up or down in share. And retailers tend to look at the market share number to see if they're up or down in share um, within specific categories. So that's about um, all we can uh, pull out of our um, category overview at this at this level now. The other thing that I strongly suggest is that sometimes we only tend to look at things uh, from a 52-week time period, but there's something else to consider. You should also be looking at another time period so that you can understand if that 2% decline that you saw in 52 weeks is trending up or down in shorter time periods. And this is when having some effective scorecards and reports that you can quickle down to take a look at these things is so critical. Um, so now we're looking at latest 24 weeks. So we're going to take a look at these numbers and then um, determine uh, how this compares to the 52-week results. So you can see that the total category is actually down 6% in this example. So in the shorter time period, it's declining at a faster rate. So not a good sign. It's driven by a loss in all three segments, family, adult, and kids and significant absolute volume loss in, in the three as well. So the, the volume loss in the latest 24 weeks, it's kind of scary. It's actually $2 million, and it was $1.8 million in the 52-week time period. So the issues are stemming very much from the latest 52, or the latest 24-week time period, and things are kind of going downhill, and so we need to quickly figure out what the heck is going on and try to make some significant changes before we continue to lose even more volume. So in that, it's really important to consider more than one time period to truly see trends and issues short term before they become a huge issue. So based on this, we're going to stick to our 24-week uh, analysis of the data so we can okay. 
So based on this twenty four week information, absolute volume change across the different um, segments and really see where the issues are being driven from. So it's really manufacturers number one and two that are driving the negative results across family and adult, and number two driving the results in the kids segment. So once again, if you're only looking at percent change versus a year ago, you may focus all your efforts on the family and kids segment, but the adult segment volume is significant. You'll also notice that the adult segment now has a 6.8 market share. So if you're going to recall, if you can recall, Retailer X had a 7 share in the latest 52 weeks, and it's the least developed segment for the retailer, and it's also the largest segment. And now the share is sliding even more. So there's a lot of things that they need to um, be taking a look at in this category. So that's as far as we're going to go on that. The next step with that analysis would be to tie in with the tactics and see which tactics are up and down because that really drives volume. And so that ties in with my next tip, which is understanding and using the four P's to drive action in the category. So the category tactics, each of the four P's influences volume and share within a brand or category, and they really are the key drivers and create action for the category. They need to be monitored in order to understand how they impact volume, growth, or decline within a brand or category. It's really about putting the right product in the right place at the right price at the right time. And I'm pretty sure you've probably all heard that expression before. It was not something I can take uh, credit for myself. Um, if if you didn't know, the four P's became popular back in the 1960s by a marketing teacher. Um, he used the four P's to describe the ingredients of the marketing mix. Um, for suppliers, the four P's really tie in with the marketing decisions under the supplier's control that can affect the demand for their product. So simply put, suppliers need to create a product that a specific group of customers wants, sell it into stores where those same people visit regularly, and price it appropriately so that it matches the value they feel they get out of the product, and do that all at a time that they want to buy. A lot of hard work needs to go into finding the right combination of the four P's for consumers, from a supplier perspective, which include a lot of data and analytics. But even if there's a really great plan in place based on the four P's that's really focused, its focus is on the brand consumer, that's where 30 to 50 percent of decision, purchase decisions are being made. There's a whole other piece that's missing there, and it because your product still needs to be sold through retail channels. So no matter how successful a supplier's marketing program is, their results will be limited without the support of the retailers. So in brick and mortar retailers or those that have physical stores, different suppliers' plans are presented to retailers who have formed categories from similar products being offered across the different suppliers. Much of category management is driven by the decisions that are made across the four P's because they can have a significant impact on both the consumer and shopper's purchase decisions. And that's where 50 to 70 percent of the decisions are made are in the store. So you can have great plans and everything else in place on the supplier side, but if you don't have your um, retailers bought in and things set up properly in the stores, then um, things may not work out as well as they could or should have. And that's really why it's so important to understand the retailer strategies, to sell in the right solutions to different retailers based on what they're trying to accomplish and create win-win solutions that are going to help to build the category for the retailer and ultimately build the supplier's business as well. And when changes are made to one of the supplier's four P's, it typically has an effect on at least one of the P's for the retailer. So obviously, retailers also make changes to their four P's through their category plans and through their day-to-day -day business. And these changes impact the consumer and the shopper, which ultimately are going to affect the volume and the profit for both retailers and suppliers. So it's in the best interest of the supplier from different functions to really understand and consider those retailer strategies and really consider how the changes in the four P's are going to impact each retailer. And retailers also need to have strong category plans that include each of the four P's and constantly monitor their results to make sure that they're making the right choices to ultimately build volume, share, and profit for the category. 
So your reporting should tie in with volume and share results. I mentioned that, that when we were doing the last analysis. Um, so here's a category assessment for retailer X, and down the left we have products in the assessment. It, this one only includes manufacturers for simplicity, but you should also have some other key segments based on the consumer decision tree. And then in the columns, we have some volumetric results. We're only looking at dollar volume and percent change in this example, but you should have other columns like absolute volume change, market share, and share point change. So when I look at these numbers, I can see that retailer X is declining at a slightly faster rate than the market. And this that they're losing market share because their growth is behind the market growth. I can see that manufacturers number two and four are driving the negative growth in the category. But this isn't enough information for me to take any action on. And the worst thing, I remember when I used to work at P&G and, uh, you know, the president would come running down or some senior executive would come running down, why do we lose share on Tide? And we'd all be like going, oh, my God, we don't know. And we didn't have the ability at that time to really take, there wasn't as much data. I guess I'm dating myself a little bit. But, um, if, you know, to have proper scorecards where you can quickly look across and identify based on um, what's happening in terms of some of the key uh, measures that you can have across the four P's, it's incredibly valuable. So um, by adding in the measures that tie in with changes in the four P's, I can easily see what is most likely drawing, driving the results. You can't, it's not 100% for sure, but it's a pretty good indication of what's driving the results. So um, when I look across them, I can and see that promotional support in the category is down slightly, but quite significantly on the two largest manufacturers in the category. So manufacturers number one and number two have lost significant promotional support, while manufacturer number three has increased significantly and, and obviously gained that support. We can see that display support is down 14% for the category and driven by all the, the, like the three big manufacturers in the category, manufacturers num number one, two, and three. The number of items in the category really hasn't changed very much. And then the average unit price has increased by 5%. So there's a couple of things that may be driving the results down for the retailer a combination of reduced promotion and display support, as well as an increase in the average price. So this is a very simple version of a category assessment, and they can get much more complex with many moving parts. You can start tying in baseline and incremental sales data, which even makes this sing more. I love baseline and incremental sales data. Um, much of this is going to be based on the sophistication of the data in your organization, also what you're responsible for, the data and mining tools that you have in place, and or the report systems that you have in place. Uh, but these results need to be reviewed regularly. Sometimes we tend to be so focused on um, getting projects done and those kind of things that we forget to take a look at things, like just from this way that I've been walking you through today of taking a look at the big picture of what the heck is going on in the category and where there, where's the biggest opportunities, both for the retailer as well as the suppliers. Tip number six is to engage all functions in your organization in category management. Um, there's a lot of supplier organizations out there who still believe that sales and marketing should not be engaged in or understand category management. Category management resource, they believe that category management resources are the only ones who do category management work. There are data pullers, the PowerPoint makers, and the ones who can talk about and explain the data. And sales should be selling and marketing should be marketing. But I am totally here today to dispel that myth. It's something that really limits the whole ability of an entire organization um, with, with those kind of uh, perspectives. So, the suppliers I just talked about on the previous slide, <coughs> excuse me, um, they, may, they most likely follow a very traditional sales approach. So first, the brand and research and development folks, they develop the new products in their secret laboratories. Then we have the marketing department who's responsible for doing the consumer testing, determining the target consumer and how to reach them. And then the new products are passed on to, our, to the sales team, and sales is responsible for spinning a pitch on the new product launch. And then the new products are presented to the retailer. And suppliers are typically focused first on brand 
and then on category, if they, if they even look at the category at all. The addition of category analysis and planogramming by suppliers is an added value to the retailer and a standard practice in the consumer packaged goods industry. So you can see I've added in the category analysis um, uh, bubble here. And a fact-based approach behind the category opportunities from a supplier perspective can really make a big difference in the results, particularly if the supplier positions the opportunity from a category opportunity and not just a brand-driven opportunity. But having the category management work completed at the end of the process means that the category management team is sometimes stuck trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Because when you think about it, marketing creates the new product launch plans, including distribution targets, in the absence of the category management team. The category management team usually will receive the initiative at the same time, and sales is responsible for presenting the new product launch, including the backup data that was supplied by the category management analyst to meet the distribution targets. And the category management analyst being responsible for making the new initiatives, initiatives fit at their retailers based on the marketing from a category management perspective that are most impossible to attain. And this can include into the planograms that really don't belong there. And I'm intentionally being somewhat negative here to get my point across because at no point in this whole process does the retailer strategy come into play. It's all about getting the distribution targets achieved in as many stores as possible, even if it's not the right product for the right retailer. Thanks, Jeremy. He said I'm describing the exact process at his last employer. <laughs> and it, it goes on a lot out there. It's quite incredible. So you can't have the category management work completed at the end of the process. It results in a reactive approach to the business. And you're, like I said, you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. And it's a very difficult thing to do. So if I go back to our model, suppliers present products that aren't aligned to retailer strategies. And yes, in many cases, on the other side, the retailers will make listings purely based on the negotiating on negotiating listing fees. And who are they forgetting in all this? They're forgetting that target consumer and shopper who has unique needs at each retailer that they shop at. And leaving retailers making decision, listing decisions that may go against their overall assortment principles and it's not focused on their shoppers who is what they need to be thinking about. Um, and this continues to happen and it's, it's quite amazing in today's age that, that these kind of decisions continue to happen because at the end of the day, the costs associated with bringing in the wrong products and then clearing it out because it doesn't even sell are significant. So the opportunity is to integrate a category management approach in all aspects of the organization, supplier's organization. From product development to marketing to sales, a category approach is considered. Data is purchased proactively up to 18 months before a new product launch happens. And this gives suppliers insights into how the new products might fit into the category for each retailer based on their overall assortment strategies. And the data and learnings are integrated into the sales presentations. So sales no longer has to rely on relationship-only selling and lots of money to get new products listed. A fact-based, value-added approach can be invaluable to the retailer. And this creates a tailored approach for retailers based on their strategies. And really, suppliers who are able to adopt this approach become much more strategic with their new product launches through strong category and consumer understanding. And also, suppliers need to ensure that they're communicating with all functions at the retailer who are involved in the category. And retailers are demanding this more and more. I know that the Category Management Association, if you have anything to do with them, they're running a huge um, uh, uh, research area on collaboration. And collaboration is kind of the buzzword of 2014. Um, and in order to get there, these are the kind of things that need to be kind of cleaned up and, and really making sure that the processes are in place to really consider that retailer strategy well in advance of um, that those distribution targets being created and, and pushing things out to retailers. My next one is on no PowerPoint decks. I don't care who you are and what the reason is, but you do not to need to bring in a 70 or 80 page PowerPoint um, deck to anyone to present to. Um, and I have found um, through experience that there are some very classic signs of when your audience is not engaged. So, Here's an example of, um, this was not one of my training 
programs. This was a competitive training program where the people were just clearly not engaged. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, but if your audience seems to be focused on other things than your presentation, or this is another example of a bad situation, if they seem exceptionally tired while you're presenting, it could be that they've lost track of your presentation or that they're plain bored. So these are all classic signs that result from a big, boring PowerPoint deck. Too much information and not enough focus. So, all presentations need to have a proper flow and focusing the presentation on your customers' conditions, needs, limitations, and opportunities. And it doesn't matter who your customer is. It could be an internal customer or an external customer for both a retailer and supplier. If you only present what's relevant to them based on what's important to them, they will stay engaged. Many good ideas and solutions get lost in very poorly built presentations that have 57 pie charts, all kinds of tables, and by the end of it, your head is spinning and you're not exactly sure what you're supposed to do. But it doesn't focus on the customer's priorities and um, really needs to hone in on one or two ideas. And the last uh, recommendation is to have a plan and desired outcomes for your analysis projects. It's a very, very important thing to do. Um, we've all been assigned projects in our professional careers, some of us more than others, um, whether it's from your boss, um, a peer, a client, and you may get that request through a meeting, a phone call, or an email. So once you've been assigned the project, of course, you're anxious to do a great job. So rah, rah, can't wait to get it done, trying to figure out how to fit it into your um, super busy schedule. So what do you do? You dive in head first to get it done and to meet your deadlines. And so, after you dive in, you work, and you work, and you work. And what does that sometimes result in? Sometimes, this is what happens. And this is actually one of my favorite um, images that I got off the internet, and there was no author or no credit um, given to it. Um, but how the customer explained it, how the project leader understood it, and how the analyst designed it. Um, so what went wrong? How did you create something completely different than what your customer or project leader articulated? You may not have taken some time um, to, with some pre-planning steps prior to jumping in to get the project done. And sometimes it can be also be intimidating if it's like a senior manager or something that asks you to do something and so you don't clarify exactly what it is or in some cases it ends up that they're, they're not exactly sure um, what it is that they're looking for and they kind of explain it not very succinctly. So we've got a great process. It's a very simple process to completing an analysis project. Um, really so you don't end, you can end up with a fantastic product at the end instead of something that may not even be close to what was expected for the for this specific situation. So you need to defi first define the business opportunity or issue, and this includes defining the customer, the decisions that will be made on the analysis, the objectives, and the key questions to be addressed, and what success will look like. And you should review this with your customer whether it's internal or external, to make sure that you're clear on the overall expectations and outputs from the project, especially if it's something big that's going to take you days or weeks to complete. As a supplier, if it's a retailer request, share the plan with them and clarify expectations. Just because they may have some added value stuff that they want or say, oh no, you don't need to do that at all, because some of those things can end up being days or weeks long of work that you do that ends up getting tossed. And as a retailer, the more clear you are with your requests and requirements to suppliers, the more successful the project is going to be. So don't do it so fast. Don't just jump in and start doing the analysis. Next, you need to create the plan instead of determining the plan as you go along. This includes defining the data and the tools required, any additional or missing data that's required, who else needs to be involved, the decision makers, as well as a critical path. Um, I know that a lot of clients we work with, they don't even know what I mean by a critical path, but it's putting in key dates and ownership and key steps that need to be done to make sure that everything is going to be done by that deadline date. And the third step is to organize and assemble the data. Um, and sometimes if you're buying new data sources, that can take actually quite a bit longer um, than anticipated. 
And then it's, of course, the fun stuff, which is analyzing the data, looking for the trends, opportunities, everything that ties in, in with the specific business issue. And then summarizing the key findings and making sure that they do tie into the specific uh, opportunity or business issue that you're working on and nothing else. And then from this, you use your analysis results, experience, and judgment to define the business actions and recommendations that are called for based on the results and you provide those recommendations, once again, tied to step number one. And then finally, you review the analysis and action steps with the decision makers and then present to the customer. I've also added in an eighth step, which is summarizing the project, and that's after the analysis project is complete. It's incredible how many excellent projects get lost because no one, there's no place to capture um, the, the completed project and do a post-evaluation of it as well. Very important um, because it, it's, it's a shame all that time is put, put against a, a great project and then a year later somebody goes and starts from scratch doing something really similar to what, you've, what you did instead of it being something that they can kind of steal and reapply and, and use a lot of the same um, process and approach. So taking these steps will ensure a much better success rate with your analysis projects. So those are the eight steps, uh, the eight tips for you today um, that I've walked you through. And hopefully you've got um, a few new ideas of things that you can um, take away and use at your own desk as it relates to category management. So I hope you got something out of that. I'm going to spend the next few minutes um, letting you know a little bit more about uh, Category Management Knowledge Group and um, a little bit more about what we're about and uh, the approach that we take. And hopefully you'll be excited about it. We've made a few changes, actually, that we are very excited about in in terms of our approach um, based on a lot of feedback that we've had from students and our, and our key st stakeholders with our clients. So the first important thing to note is that our training is designed to meet your needs and it doesn't matter if you're an individual, a team, or an or organization. We don't just jump in and just try to throw you a standard program and tell you to go take it. Um, so for individuals, we have a three-step process to purchase. Down the left-hand side, you can see all of our accredited courses. We also have some additional courses and we're continuing to create more courses. We have two right now. We're working on a trade marketing and trade promotion course, as well as um, category management in the convenience channel. I was a facilitator at the convenience store university down in Arizona last week, and it was a huge hit. And so we're going to be focusing some training convenience channel. We also have some standard programs, which is a combination of courses um, that you can take, and they also match up with the levels, the foundational, intermediate. So as an individual, you can pick your courses or your programs. Uh, these are $99 per course. Um, you can also just buy an annual membership, and I'll tell you a little bit about the, the um, when you purchase a seat, what you get with that, because it's a pretty sweet deal. Um, and you can also use our assessment course to determine your training opportunities. So if you're not sure where you want to start, because you don't really know where you need training, but you just know that you need some, um, you can take our assessment, online assessment course. It's an hour-long test. goes across all of our courses and really comes back with um, a great uh, custom program built for you. Um, then you can also pick your options. We have hard copy study guides. We also have case studies tied in with our three programs. Um, you're ready to go and we will work with you to um, determine exactly what the right approach is and uh, get you up and running right away. For groups of greater than five people, we have what we're, we call our new gold standard approach um, where first of all you determine the number of seats. Each student needs a seat and the costs decrease with the larger the number of seats. So as you go up in the number of seats, then your, your, the cost of each seat goes down. And then you determine the total number of courses. So what we do is we have a consultation with you and the key stakeholders on your team to determine the specific needs and develop the best plan to meet those needs. The higher the number of courses, and this is a total number of courses across all the students, the lower the cost per course. We also have an assessment once again, that you can use as a course to determine the best curriculum for each individual on your team. So we can actually go through and create custom curriculum program for, for each student. Um, and we can also use that assessment as a pre and post evaluation for your organization if you're interested in measuring the return on investment. And that's at no additional cost. That's just part of doing business with CMKG. 
And then finally, um, determining your options. So there's payment options. You can pay as you go. So you can actually just buy seats for um, the students, and then they can just take sporadically take uh, courses, and um, you can pay as you go. Or we also have quarterly, biannual, or full payment options. And um, full payment options is where you get your lowest cost per course, um, and then they just kind of go up from there. And there, we also have tons of different training options. We have case studies, study guides, live sessions, live webinars, customization of training, um, whatever it is that, um, that you feel is necessary to really create a program that's going to work for your organization. And the other cool thing is that any unused courses, so if you buy, I'm just making up a number of 500 courses, and in 2014, in the one-year period, you'll only use 400, then we just push forward those unused 100 courses um, into 2015 or whenever your contract expires, and then you just have to pay for the seats, but you have that total access to those courses again. So our clients love this because then we're not, they're not paying for unused stuff. I've talked about an annual seat. What that includes um, is any access to the online courses and testing that you've purchased and updated student transcripts and reports. But it also includes a resource library. Uh, we are incredibly active in social media. We have over 250 white papers. Um, our students love it because um, you can do a search on a word and find all the white papers that are associated with that. And we're constantly adding in new stuff. We also have daily news feeds that we put into there. We, and we actually just created a LinkedIn group um, for our student alumni. And that's where we um, keep them updated on what's going on. Um, in terms of the training and giving training tips and ways to better schedule yourself to complete your online training, those kind of things. We have an anonymous student forum where students can um, give feedback and, and uh, engage in conversations, but from an, an anonymity standpoint, so we can, we're sensitive about um, exposing names and company names. We have a dynamic glossary that's all online and searchable and uh, has over 300 terms and definitions and links out to other things and resource materials. We have a book club, a solution provider directory, and probably I have the most valuable thing at the very bottom. Um, we have six complimentary live webinars per year that are just for our students. And they're excellent. Um, they're very much hands-on. They tend to be focused on in a case study approach. Um, as an example, we have David King, who is a spaceman guru. Him and I are going to be co-facilitating our one that's coming up in a few weeks with our students, um, talking about space management and going through and learning how to strategically look at and understand planograms. So um, the other thing that we can say that we have that is um, uh, best in class and it's, it's our highest rated part of what we offer is our support for our students as they complete their programs. Um, we have our, everyone that works at CMKG is certified um, and so they can answer your questions, we can talk about content, if we want every single student to succeed. And um, we also have a live chat so when you're in the e-learning center you can click on the chat with us and you can actually talk to us um, during business hours, asking questions and such. And so the students absolutely love that. We have email support, phone support, online uh, frequently asked questions and how-to videos. And we're always looking for new and exciting ways to keep our students engaged. And we're also very friendly and helpful. We like to think so. OK. Um, so really, the training needs to be flexible enough to meet the unique needs of each of our our clients. So everybody has different needs, different plans, different everything, and so that's why we've created this so that it is completely to meet your specific needs. Um, one of the things that we do really try to push with our clients, we've been doing this for quite a while, is that if you don't have a, if you don't have people on a schedule and timelines and a start date and an end date and touch points and all those kind of things, the training just is not as effective. So we really do try to um, push for some of the things that we consider to be best in class to really have a successful um, to have a successful uh, experience and, and get a really good return on investment for the training because that's one of our biggest most important things. Um, I, Lucia, somebody asked, um, they don't know if it would be useful for them to have the annual seat. One of the things that we do have available um, is that you can have a get a 48 hour to look at our e-learning center and to see all of the resources and see if it's something that would be of added value to you. And um, 
uh, with that annual as well, so get those six live webinars. So that, and so if you like getting learning in this kind of format that we're in today, then it's definitely something that would be of value to you. And it doesn't matter if you're in Mexico. Um, mo everything that we talk about, it, we try to make it relevant for everybody. So we don't get into such specifics that we're discluding people who won't get won't get value out of it. Um, here's some, uh, just a few other things. We're so engaged in social media. Um, if you're not already in already in our category management learning forum group, we have over 5,600 people in there now, um, and we share all kinds of. Uh, we we have we're actually um, a very one of the most active uh, groups in LinkedIn. So it's pretty cool. Um, so you can follow. You can go. You can either go and follow our company in Category Management Knowledge Group. We tend to release a lot more news information in the Category Management Knowledge Group. In the Category Management Learning Forum, um, we are focused on um, sharing great white papers and articles and stuff that relate more specifically to category management. Um, like I said, we also have the weekly blog and the monthly newsletter. If you go into our um, if you go into our uh, the view materials and you go in there, you can find all the links in there. It's probably the easiest way. Our newsletter is incredibly popular. My blog um, has become um, super popular too, which is kind of fun. And I try to write weekly. I've been a little bit uh, uh, not doing that in the last couple of weeks, but I'll be getting back to it next week. Um, we have a student advisory board. So we have 15 members that include some key stakeholders of some very large organizations that will um, give us feedback on all of our ideas and plans and it's the most valuable time that we spend is getting feedback from this advisory board. We absolutely love them and appreciate everything that they do for us. Um, and that's about it. So I also have been asked, will this webinar be available for replay? It absolutely is. Um, if you like the webinar, uh, it, a recording is going to be available next week. Um, so if you want other people to see it, you can let your peers know it's available and we'll be advertising um, when it's available through LinkedIn and all of our social media. So hopefully it'll be um, available somewhere in there and for anyone who registered for this webinar and didn't make it, they'll also have access to the recording as soon as it's available. Some of the other things you might want to consider, um, we do offer a 15 minute consultation session um, with CMKG to learn more about us and understand how we can develop a training solution to meet your needs. I've already talked about the social media stuff. And we also have a link for all of the other live webinars in 2014, including many topics. Um, and we also have our category management overview webinar coming up in a few weeks. So once again, you can go into the materials section and go to training and uh, get all of the links in there so that you can get access to everything that you need. So I hope you enjoyed your, uh, the uh, webinar today. And imagine if I had had to throw in two more how fast I would have been talking. Oh my goodness, I'd have a sore throat by the end. So I hope you got some value out of this. Um, I always enjoy doing these. It's how we really connect with um, people and, and let you know that we've got some great training out there. And hopefully, if you are in the need for category management training, you will consider CMKG. So I thank you very much for uh, coming today, and I wish you all a great day. We have like minus 28 degree weather or something lovely here in Calgary today, so not planning to go anywhere outside, but um, you have a great day and stay warm. Take care.